Uh, so we'll now move on to our uh, next speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Rosie Hogg, who's a consultant anaesthetist based at Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, who has a specialist interest in regional anaesthesia. Her clinical interests include the development and integration of perioperative point of care ultrasound and the use of regional anaesthesia to improve perioperative outcomes. In addition to her clinical work, she also works for the Department of Health on the future development of elective, elective care in Northern Ireland. I can attest to the fact that she's a fond of all knowledge, um, having spoken to her recently at <laughs> a meeting, and taught me on huge aspects of anaesthesia and farming. So there is no end <laughs> to this lady's work. Um, and she's very kindly agreed uh, to run through fascial plane box and nerve blocks for low limb trauma. Thanks very much, Rosie. Thank you very much, Matt. I, I was concerned you were going to mention that, but um, I never miss an opportunity to talk about farming and milk production. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you to all the team for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about lower limb blocks or trauma. Um, and it's been really, really interesting what Mornay's just been saying about how we're moving away from those deep, heavy blocks in the past, but where are we actually going to and how do we feel about moving to different types of regional anesthesia? So hopefully I can just take a little bit of time to talk you through some current evidence and maybe give you a few ideas of what you might be able to use for lower limb blocks and trauma. Now, before we get started, oh goodness, if I can see my thing to work. So how big a problem is it? So actually it's a huge problem. Um, and in particular, here's in the last sort of 10 years in England, um, and you're looking at uh, almost a million uh, finished consultant episodes and uh, admissions for things like hip fractures, uh, for ankle fractures, for distal radius fractures. And this is a huge issue um, and a huge pressure on our NHS um, at the minute. So it, it, it's not just something that we might be dealing with now and again, it's something that we're all dealing with all the time. And why is it important? Well, for starters, sorry, um, it, it costs a fortune. Um, so if you can see, this is uh, from the Public Health Journal from a number of years ago, but people coming in having a hip fracture, their total cost for that admission uh, and afterwards is around about 5,000 pounds. And that doesn't sound a lot, but in the scheme of thing, if you're looking at up to 60 to 70,000 hip fractures a year, this is a huge burden on the NHS. And, and it's not just um, the, the single individual traumatic fractures, it's multiple injuries um, and it's everything involved in that. And we can play a vital part in that, in improving outcomes um, and helping patients through this really, really difficult time. Because it's not just all about pain, is it? Like we are, as Morna said, the pain specialist, but it's not just all about pain. I had no idea about the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder in patients. There is an absolute plethora of studies, and they're mostly in the orthopedic journals, looking at the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder after even just single traumatic fractures. And I'm sure it would shock you as much as it did me to believe that it's between 20 and 30 percent of patients suffer serious levels of long-term post-traumatic stress disorder after a traumatic uh, fracture. Um, and the issue with that is what causes that? And delving down into some of these studies, it's everything involved with it, but pain has a huge part to play in that. And, and we are integral in how we address that. So of course it's pain. As Morne was saying there, we give them a PCA, everything's fine, but it's not fine, is it? We have been talking endlessly over the last few years um, about the opioid epidemic throughout the world. And we like to think that we've got away with it here or in Europe, and we haven't at all. Um, if you, you look at the long-term pattern of opioid fractures, even just after a femoral shaft fracture, so these are young people, young men, um, sort of traumatic RTAs, and even at sort of 7, 12, 4, 24 months, there's still a decent percentage that are taking what they class as low to moderate doses of um, opioids. But these are morphine equivalents of 30 to 40 milligrams per day. And that is a huge issue for patients. Um, and across the world, this is an issue. So when you see that patient, and I know we're only involved in a small part of their care, but when you think about it, if, so, if we manage their pain really well in the perioperative period, that may go on afterwards into their entire experience. And not only will it maybe affect them from a PTSD point of view, but from their opiate dependence. 
And we always think the Danes do it better than us. They always tell us that they do. But there you go, even patients who underwent hip fracture surgery. So these are the elderly patients that we think, oh, they never take any opioids. I, you know, at, at a year afterwards, 50% of those patients were still taking fairly significant amounts of chronic opioids. And the risk factors aren't always what you think. It's patients being both underweight, both overweight, different types of fractures, and the perioperative use of other medications. And it's not just pre-op use of non-steroidals, opiate medications, although that did have an element in it. It's just the presence of lots of comorbidities, and that does include anxiety and depression, but it also just includes um, chronic diseases. So we're taking a patient who maybe already has a number of issues and putting them through a very stressful occurrence, maybe not doing well with their pain. And these have proper long-term side effects. So it's important that we can have something to do with that. So let's have a look at a few different things. So what about the hip fractures? We are dealing with this day in, day out. Anywhere you work in the entire UK, you're dealing with hip fractures all the time. And we've got much better at dealing with them. The National Hip Fracture Database comes out all the time. Um, we've got really good evidence about this. Patients are being seen by orthogeriatricians sooner and they're being uh, having the operation done within 24 to 48 hours. And this is all really good. But I find this absolutely fascinating. As somebody who always does a spinal and comes from an area where everybody gets a spinal for a fractured neck and femur, actually 50% of patients who have um, operative repair for fractured neck and femur get a general anaesthetic. Now, of course, I'm a regional anaesthetist, that's understandable, but does it really matter? And uh, Matt spoke at uh, RAUK talking about there's no difference between regional and GA, but actually, actually, when it comes to hip fractures, there is. Um, and this is a, a large um, retrospective study that was published in RAPM in 2019. And actually, giving a spinal rather than a GA from hip fracture is better. It's just as simple as that. Now, this is retrospective data, and there are lots of things to tease out here. But lower 90-day mortality, and we're always talking about how mortality is not what we need to talk about these days, but, but it is as well. Um, less pulmonary embolus, shorter hospital stay. And yes, there's no difference in the cardiac events and things like that. But what there is a difference in, and we see it again and again, it's a reduction in that perioperative and postoperative delirium, which is absolutely essential for patients. And the Regain trial, which is based out of Philadelphia with Mark Newman, is going to finish recruiting soon. And this is a huge study of about 1,600 patients looking at the comparison between regional and general anesthesia and really about promoting that independence. So will your patient get back to how they were before they had their hip fracture or are we leaving patients to a completely different way of life. So guidelines, we love guidelines. And uh, here's another one from last year from anesthesia um, and some really, really excellent um, advice from just the science of people who work uh, in hip fracture management, including Richard Griffiths and, and the team. And what I really liked about these guidelines is that they stated unequivocally that peripheral nerve blocks should be used to routinely to supplement general or spinal anesthesia. OK, so we all do that and we all know that. But that's guidelines for everybody to think, well, hang on a minute. What do I have to do in my practice that will improve patient care? And it's, it's difficult to tease out in the hip fracture database about how many blocks were given to those patients with general anesthesia. But it's, it's important whenever we're thinking about this is that it's not just one and done. We, we, we have to think about the perioperative analgesia. So what do we do? Well, first off, let's go all the way back. And I can hear you all groan from here talking about anatomy. Really sorry, but it's all about the anatomy. So the anatomy of the hip joint is extremely complicated. You know, we all just think that's the lumbar plexus and that's done. And while the majority of it does come from the lumbar plexus, there are elements coming from the sciatic nerve, um, lots and lots of little articular branches. But the main the, the main nerve supply of the hip and the hip joint is from the lumbar plexus. And if you can think all the way back to, to back then when we were all learning our anatomy, this is a cross section at L4. So I can already hear you thinking, where are we going with this? So if you want to provide good analgesia for the hip, you want to block, block the lumbar plexus. So why don't we block it right at the top? Why, why don't we do that? Because that works really well. It gives excellent analgesia. You're sure to get everything that you need. Um, and you can block it at any point you want. So 
back in the day, we used to use the old uh, lumbar plexus block. It was, uh, everybody's a bit terrified of it, and rightly so, okay? It's a, it's a fairly complicated block. It works brilliantly in those people's hands who do it really, really well. We were sticking very long needles deep into patients who were maybe on anticoagulants, and then ultrasound came along, and while it's a blessing in some way, it possibly stepped a lot of us back from, from doing regional anesthesia. So when you look at that, um, that diagram of the ultrasound, you can see the lumbar plexus there is marked in green and there's lots and lots of different ways to get into the lumbar plexus and we hear people talking all the time now about erector spinae blocks about quadratus lumborum blocks and all of these are ways to get into that area where the lumbar plexus is which is sitting in the body of psoas um, and really what we're looking at here is power vertebral by proxy in a way as well so we're looking for a lumbar plexus block or a distal lumbar plexus block or a power vertebral by proxy. And these are really, really great for excellent analgesia and can be used for anesthesia as well in patients that you might be concerned about doing a spinal in. And does it work? Yes, of course it works. It works wonderfully. Now, um, this study compared block to no block, which is always uh, challenging, but uh, it shows that uh, the anterior quadratus lumborum block, where you're going right in front of um, the QL block, we won't get into the nomenclature because that's something else. Um, showed a, a significant reduction in pain scores in patients who are having total hip arthroplasty, which is very similar to a fracture neck and femur. And what about ESP? That's very much the, uh, the block of the moment, isn't it? And in fact, the team over at Stanford have moved away from using fascial iliaca catheters uh, to using continuous erector spinae blocks for, their, um, for, for early ambulation with, again, total hip arthroplasty. And they've got some really, really good results um, and in particular, reduced pain scores, increased mobility, um, and getting getting people up and walking very, very quickly. And, that, and that's fantastic. Um, and the other thing about that is that it's comparable, to, uh, rectus spinae block is comparable to a traditional lumbar plexus block. So again, a bit like we talk about power vertebra by proxy when we talk about ESP, it's a little bit of lumbar plexus by proxy as well, which is excellent because the lumbar plexus block is deep, um, it can't be compressed in any way, it it's, can sometimes be difficult to visualise on ultrasound. So having these alternative blocks to use can be really, really helpful. But I can hear you all groaning at me. Do not think that I do not know what everybody is saying. Oh, there they go again. Those regional nieces talking about their ESPs and their QL1s and their QL2s and getting everybody really, really confused. And when we do that, so many people say to me, well, that's it. It just goes in the too difficult box and I'm not gonna do it at all. And that is not what we want to promote. So whenever those of us who are really enthusiastic about regional anesthesia talk about it, it's, we want everybody to have it because we know how well it can work, but we don't want it to be at the expense of anesthetists concerned about complications. We don't want to be at the expense of patients having complications. And that's why our UK and Lloyd Turbot in particular have promoted the, the plan A blocks. So these are the lower limb plan A blocks. So these are the blokes that we feel, and certainly the college, when you're looking at um, the, the new curriculum and things, feel that everybody should be able to do and be able to do confidently. So it's not just about, oh, occasionally I'm going to have a look at this and give it a go. These are blocks that you are happy to do routinely. And the three that have been chosen are the femoral nerve block, the doctor canal block, and the pop tail block, which we'll talk about a little bit again. But these blocks are easy to learn. The anatomy is fairly straightforward in most people. And I think it's really important that we try and incorporate them into our clinical practice every day. But I can hear everybody saying, well, hang on a minute. The femoral nerve block, you've just told us that that doesn't cover uh, hip surgery. Well, do, do we have to make a decision? So do, do you have to change? Do you have to say, well, I'm going to do an ASP, I'm going to do this. Well, hang on. Maybe instead of saying, I'm not going to do a block or I am going to do a block, why don't we start thinking, well, I'm quite happy to do the top down block. So I'm quite happy to do an ESP or a QL or a lumbar plexus block, but I'll wait for a bit more evidence. Or hang on a minute, I'm not as confident to do that. So I would prefer to go from the bottom up. And all of this is OK, but there is no one way to give a good anaesthetic. We know that there's not it's not a prescriptive thing. It's about the patient. It's about our confidence, but it's about being open to new and different ideas. So I'm not going to teach you how to do all these blocks today because we haven't got enough time. And I don't need to teach you how to do all these blocks anyway, because we have so many fantastic online 
um, uh, videos that, that can teach you how to do this. We've got um, fantastic journal articles. We've got so many review articles. And the, I'll just give you the recommendations for these, and you can have the QR codes there if you want to link to them. So uh, our EKM, Dr. Amit Pawa, has put together uh, the seven um, Plan A blocks, and these are, are quick, easy to watch videos um, that show you how to do these blocks. Um, really big shout out to uh, Duke Anesthesiology. They, their RAPS uh, team have done, again, excellent short um, videos, and I really, really like this one for the subringual fascial liaca plane block. Um, and no talk on uh, regional CZ would be complete without mentioning Ki Jin Chin. Um, and he has a fantastic YouTube channel. Um, and in particular, this is a really, really uh, good video for the Peng block, which we'll talk about in a second. So rather than trying to learn it all in 20 minutes with me talking to you in the evening, take your time, have a look, watch a few of the videos, talk to your colleagues, find out who's doing what, um, and actually tr just try scanning first. And once you start seeing what, what's there, it's going to be really, really easy to adapt this into your clinical practice. And why should you adapt it into your clinical practice? Well, the recent uh, Cochrane review he, last year um, from Sandy Kopp over in the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Guy, that basically showed that peripheral nerve blocks in hip fractures give better outcomes to the patients. And we're not talking about mortality and things like that. We're talking about things that matter to the patients as they're in hospital and, and afterwards, because mortality is a big, complicated thing that we may have some influence on, but it, it, I think we need to drill down into what we can really affect. So things like pain, of course, absolutely fantastic, and in particular, pain on movement and positioning for spinals and things like that. And I know so many of our ED colleagues are working really, really hard on getting um, peripheral nerve blocks into the ED to be able to get these patients really, really comfortable and to avoid opiates. And that, that is such a fantastic thing for simple blocks to be there, even in the pre-hospital arena, to be able to make patients comfortable so quickly. Um, and in particular, their acute confusional states, um, chest infections, time to first mobilization, all of these things are helped by the use of peripheral nerve blocks. Now, we can talk about which peripheral nerve block is uh, important to use, but just doing a block and doing it well will significantly help your patient um, in the perioperative and, the, and in particular the postoperative period. So what about the pop-pop fascia liaca block, which we've been doing for years? And it, it does work. In a lot of patients, um, it works really, really nicely. The problem is we have no idea where our pop pops are. Um, and then we started uh, using our ultrasound probe to look for it. And really all we ended up doing was doing a femoral nerve block because we located our fascia iliaca and we injected. And it was a bit like when we moved from pop pop taps to ultrasound guided taps, we moved much uh, too far away from what we actually wanted to block. So it's a really good study that came out in 2019 in Rapim which showed um, from a cadaver study that the super inguinal injection um, of the fascia liaca block is, is, is better than the, the old pop-pop or the infra inguinal injection. And that makes sense because what you're trying to do is you're going back to that three-in-one um, block in Winnie's time where you want to try and push as much local anesthetic up through that psoas compartment and block those three nerves of the, of the lumbar plexus. Um, and, and in particular, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how with um, the, the superior fascia lacca block, um, the superior and granular fascia lacca block, that it gets that lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh um, in quite a lot of uh, areas as well, which again, it's, it's why the femoral nerve block is helpful in hip um, surgery, but it's not ideal because you're, you're only blocking one of the, the three parts. And what about the Peng block? This is the new trendy block in town. And again, I can hear everybody groaning, oh, they're at it again with another new block. But this block is actually lovely. It's incredibly simple. And if you can do a femoral nerve block, you can do a pen block. Um, and it's, it's one of those blocks that when you start using it, you think, my goodness, this is fantastic. And one of the, the big reasons for it is that because of, of where it is, it's, it's, a, an, it's not really an articular block but it seems to affect the psoas muscles and relax them. I think a lot of the pain that patients get from hip fractures um, is that sort of muscle spasm. And this block really seems to help and, and helps more compared with even a femoral nerve block. And that makes sense. It's again, more of a proximal block. You're trying to get more, more of that lumbar plexus um, and, and, try, and it's covering maybe more of those interarticular branches that we don't get um, with traditional blocks. Um, and, and again, 
it's not reducing our quadriceps strength, which is, is, is important. And I know everybody says, oh, it doesn't really matter. Our patients aren't going to get out of bed. But if you look at the recent hip fracture database data, there were a large number of patients who weren't mobilized on day one after the hip fracture surgery, and a large number that even by day three hadn't been mobilized. And we know that mobilization is essential for good um, perioperative care, for um, improving, reducing, uh, improving outcomes, reducing PEs and chest infections. So being able to do these blocks that then prevent the patient from being stuck in bed, it's, it's really, really important. And I said I wasn't going to tell you how to do it, but um, if you if you want to watch some amazing videos, Vincente Rooks, uh, his videos are absolutely exceptional um, and I can highly recommend them. And this is really what you're going for. And I've got a little bit of a video here that shows you. So there you go. There's your femoral artery sitting uh, very nicely. And all that you do is that you drift your probe up from the inguinal lig ligament cranially. And what you'll see um, is you'll see it changing from uh, uh, from where you see the hip joint up onto the iliopubic ramus. And what you have to, all you have to do there is uh, bring your needle in laterally um, and, and inject under that psoas tendon. And as you can see there, and what that does is very, very quickly, excellent analgesia. And in particular for patients who are maybe in the ED, very, very painful, you just need to bring your needle down and, um, and hit bone. It's, and which I know sounds incredibly simple, but it works really, really well. And that's that's all I'm going to say about for hip fractures. And um, I really like this. Uh, I know it, it may be a little bit twee, but I think it's important that we don't have a prescriptive way that you must do this block for hip analgesia, because and, and really for all analgesia, because what works in my institution and what works for me may not work somewhere else. It may not work with your team. It may not work with your surgeons. Um, so we could just say, well, I'll just do, you do you, I, everybody does their own thing. And I don't think that's where we need to go. I think we need to start looking at collaborative research and our UK research network is, is being set up for that. So rather than just saying, well, everybody just do their own thing and I'm sure it will be fine. Let's look at what we're doing and actually say, well, look, this block is better than this block because we have endless amounts of case reports and case studies, but we really need the hard research on what block works best in our patients. And, and if it's something simple, all the better. So I'll leave hip fractures for now. What about all those other fractures? So, of course, um, you know, younger patients coming in, highly traumatic injuries, we're talking about compartment syndrome. So, uh, you know, we've got everything there from uh, distal femurs to tibial plateau fractures to nasty patellar injuries. So, depending on what your surgeon likes to do or whatever your, your, is normally done at your institution, these may be blocked routinely and they may not be. Um, and some of the concern, obviously, is um, patients having those dense blocks. And we're trying to move away to the more motor sparing blocks. So the, the block for that is, of course, the adductor canal block, an extremely easy block to do. Again, uh, if you can do a femoral nerve block, uh, you can do an adductor canal block. And there's really good evidence to say that it's as good as a femoral nerve block for analgesia, certainly um, in total knee arthroplasty. We'll not get into uh, other uh, nerves going to the knee right now, but you actually need to put an awful lot of local anaesthetic um, into the adductor canal to get profound quadriceps weakness. And again, that's good even for patients who won't be mobilizing um, immediately, but just from being able to move in the bed and not having that heavy leg sensation. Um, and again, and when we're using those lower doses uh, and avoiding that concern with compartment syndrome. And again, here we go. Uh, we're looking at the adductor canal here, sartorius on the top. Um, and as you can see, uh, laterally there, you've got uh, your area of nerve tissue and very easily coming in with your needle again laterally and injecting around it. And what you want to do is you just want to encircle the nerve and that's going to get all of those sensory fibers that will supply most of the, the distal femur. And certainly, again, you know, we're talking about this. We don't need to get rid of all the pain at all times, but it's that multimodal analgesia where if there is an issue with compartment syndrome, the block will not hide that so much or there isn't as much of a concern that it will hide it. So for me, I actually asked my, I say my surgeon, the surgeon that I work with most frequently, what, what he's concerned about with uh, compartment syndrome. And he actually said, oh, very rarely, I don't mind doing blocks and anything. And, and that's great to hear. But the one thing he did say is apart from a tibial nail. And for me, this is really, really interesting because this is all about culture. 
So this is a, a publication from 1994, um, where we are in Belfast with some of our um, uh, consultant surgeons who have now retired. And this is endemic where we are, that nobody wants um, a block for a tibial nailing. And as Mornay said there, we've got to respect these kind of things. So whether it's a polytrauma and whether we decide that a block will be helpful in this case or, or whether it's not, it's all about that conversation, but it's all about culture and interaction with our colleagues. It's not about, I'm going to tell you this, or you're going to do this, or no, you can't do that. It's about individual patients. It's about looking at the patient, talking to the patient, talking to our colleagues. And instead of giving a prescriptive idea of when I have a tibial fracture, I do this, we say, what's the, what's the most important thing? But how can we avoid those chronic pain syndromes, that post-traumatic stress disorder? And how can we look at multimodal analgesia rather than just going straight for the PCA? And th this is what comes out for me. And I, I know some people have, uh, have mentioned already on Twitter about, oh, well, you know, uh, that depends on where I am. But let's look at the culture of where we work rather than just saying, well, I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. And let's dive down a little bit deeper into why people do things, because that's actually how you, how you easily come to a consensus. So we'll get down ankle fractures again, very, very common. And one of those things that you know we, we see so often um, and are incredibly painful. Um, remember again that this is a sciatic nerve. We've moved away from the lumbar plexus. Um, it's mostly the sciatic nerve, um, apart from the medial side, um, that is uh, supplied uh, by the saphenous nerve coming down uh, from the femoral. So uh, again, if you've got a trimalleolar fracture, you're going to have to block one or uh, both block both nerves. And what do we do? So. Back to our plan A blocks, the, the absolutely lo lovely popliteal nerve block, one of my favorite nerves to block. Um, and again, just remember that uh, you're going to look for that bifurcation between the tibial and the common perineal nerve, um, and you want to make sure that they're coming together. And this is a really, really great um, block to do and to put a catheter into for people who've got very complicated ankle fractures, or in fact, people who've got polytraumas who have an ankle fracture with, with lots of other issues that you can actually get on top of their analgesia really, really well. Um, and again, I know lots of people uh, inject differently. Uh, this position for me is the best way to do um, a popliteal nerve block. So the patient uh, lateral facing you, um, and you'll find it's much easier to manipulate the probe as you pull towards you. And if you do not look at one other paper that I have discussed today, this is the paper you have to look at. This is the most fascinating paper, I think, of, of one of the most fascinating ones over the last few years. So it's actually asking the patient how they got on with their block um, for ankle fracture surgery. And it is unbelievable, the responses. And, you know, we're so sometimes we're so fixated on how we do something. We don't actually think about why we doing do it and how it actually affects the patient. So. We all know this, that um, you get a patient, they have a fantastic uh, popliteal nerve block um, and they wake up in the, the, after their surgery and they're really comfortable in recovery. And then you go and see them the next day and they say it was horrendous and they had to be given 20 of morphine overnight and that sort of thing. So it, again, it's really, really important. It's not just about the block. It's about the perioperative pain management. And this is how we get confidence building in nursing staff and our, our surgical colleagues is that we're thinking about all of these things along the way. And it doesn't make any, it, it seemed to make no difference to the patient, even if they had incredible pain and rebound pain after their block wore off because they, they, they were, they, it was so good after their surgery. Um, that they, you know, they would have it again in an instant. But that's about us and about educating our patients and talking through. It's not just about saying, right, I'm going to put this block in and that's that. It's about educating our patients and making sure they take that in and educating our nursing staff. And particularly as we move to more and more day case surgery, it's really, really important that we think about that and follow up our patients. And the concerns that patients have are often very different to the ones that we have. So I highly recommend reading this paper. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And what about rebound pain? So again, we can predict it. So it's going to be, you know, um, patients who, uh, uh, you know, who are younger, who um, have uh, other issues, um, and, in, and in particular, 
those uh, male patients, and maybe it's just because they, you know, they ha are likely to have more um, uh, or a more traumatic in injury. And it's also really important to make sure that you give dexamethasone. So if you can do one thing today, even if you don't do a block, if you do one thing for your practice, um, give dexamethasone. And in particular, if you're giving a block, give dexamethasone because it increases the duration of your block, um, and it certainly decreases your risk of rebound pain. Um, so why not just give a spinal instead? But, but interestingly, um, the, the, the pain that's seen after, um, after surgery, this is a, a, a really interesting article that came out this year, um, and they were looking at, well, actually, maybe it's better to give a spinal than just giving um, a, a, a peripheral nerve block. But actually, uh, the patients who had uh, spinals had, had, a, had much more pain. They almost had I wouldn't say rebound pain, but when the spinal wore off, they were in agony and they were in agony for longer. Whereas, as you can see there on, 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 the, on the left hand side, the peripheral nerve block, yes, they got 15 hours of excellent analgesia and then their pain score rose. And, 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 but you can predict that. So maybe just spinal anesthesia isn't the answer to this, but um, used in combination. But certainly peripheral nerve blocks, if managed well, work really, really well for patients. And I would reiterate what Mornay was saying there about uh, the days of giving 40 mils of 0.5 chirocene or whatever are over, um, especially in patients who are at high risk of compartment syndrome. Let's look at giving uh, shorter acting um, anaesthetic blocks and then with longer acting sensory nerve blocks. And that's particularly important in upper limb surgeries as well, that you can use a block for, um, for anaesthesia, but then have uh, distal blocks for analgesia afterwards. Um, and I'll just mention that uh, when it comes to spinals, I know a lot of people um, have uh, were saying, oh, well, we don't want to use spinals for day surgery. But I think certainly during COVID, we have moved so far forward with using spinals and other forms of regional anesthesia for day surgery. And whereas before we would never have dreamt of sending anybody home after a spinal, now it's becoming the norm. Uh, and this is really important. Now that we're using prilocaine and chlorprocaine and we've got them available all the time, it's it's really, really important that you consider this um, for patients. Patients are very open to using this. Um, uh, as uh, There's been multiple um, uh, presentations about this, but you don't need to put it, um, opiates in with your um, spinal. But this is the way that you can do essentially a, 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 a short acting block um, for your surgery, and then you can do distal sensory um, nerve blocks, so that uh, an ankle block rather than a pop tail block or something, if, pay, if your surgeons are concerned. So there's no reason not to use spinals, just use a shorter acting spinal and maybe um, avoid, uh, if you're trying to go for day case, certainly avoid intrathecal opiates. But again, I know we keep coming back to cost, but um, outpatient surgery with ankle fractures is certainly becoming the norm now. And it's, it's excellent to reduce hospital emissions and utilize healthcare resources as well. So that's a very quick run through um, about nerve blocks for lower limb trauma. Um, we could talk about it all day, but I think what's really important to, to say again is it's not about how we do blocks. Anybody can do a block. It's why we do it and how we incorporate that into our perioperative practice. And let's start moving away from those dense, heavy blocks um, and our concerns about rebound pain and, and compartment syndrome and using motor sparing, lower doses of local anaesthetic and, and try and avoid uh, more sensory blocks and more localized blocks. And again, it's really, really important to work with not only our surgical teams, but the patient themselves, explain, educate, and work with them to, to achieve our optimum outcomes. I think that the days of just doing your anaesthetic and nothing else are, are gonna be long over, and I'm glad to see it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosie, for a fascinating talk. It was great to hear. Um, we've run slightly over, so I'm just going to, uh, just uh, time for just a couple of questions. I'm going to put you on the spot as an expert, mm -hmm. uh, as I do a trauma list, and say, so I don't get laughed at by cool trainees coming with their ultrasound in their pocket. Which block should I focus on for my neck of femur patients? QL, FI, ESP, PENG, a combination of them? Which, what do you think as the expert is the best one for our patients? So, uh, so uh, the, the answer is we don't actually know exactly what's the best thing. So I would say if you are doing regular hip fracture lists and you want something that is consistently good, um, will work really well, the pain block is really pushing forward as something that's that gets really good analgesia really, really quickly. Super inguinal fascial iliac block again, it's absolutely fantastic. The femoral nerve block, look, if that's the, the block that you are comfortable with and that you can do, do it. 
because it's better doing a, a block than not doing a block. Um, but once you, that's the thing is once you get confident, this is the whole thing behind plan A blocks. Once you get confident in that one block, then drift up and do a ping. And then when you get confident with the ping, try, you know, because you, again, you're not going to cover your lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh with your ping block. And now wh whether that matters completely, it's a lot of people debate, but then move and try a superanguinal fascia iliac block. And, and we say to people all the time, um, you know, ultrasound, people are frightened of the ultrasound, but 20 years ago when I started in anesthesia, everybody got blocks for everything. And it was the norm, it, we got the nerve simulator. There's nothing wrong with using a nerve simulator as long as you're, you know, you're using it and you're confident in your practice. It, it doesn't have to be that you have to, have to do everything in the new and different way. Let's just focus on getting good pain relief for our patients. Okay. And, and another common theme of questions is what about um, adjuncts to your blocks? So people have mentioned Dexmed, clonidine, low-dose ketamine before you start. Do you do you routinely use any? All of so these? I don't use I don't use any adjuncts in my blocks. The only thing I will admit to is that I'm a mixer for um, which is very controversial in the regional anesthesia uh, experts. Uh, for if I'm doing an, an anesthetic block, I like to mix um, uh, either ropivacaine or uh, caracaine with my uh, with lidocaine. But I always use dexamethasone. I, there has to be a really good reason for me not to give intravenous dexamethasone. My concern with using an adjunct, and lots of people use them extremely safely, is that I don't see any, personally, I don't see any benefit that I can get from IV dexamethasone and I'm giving it anyway for uh, nausea and vomiting. So for me, it's about, you know, it's a, it's, it's about giving a clean block and then the additional things with that. And it's all about multimodal, mm -hmm. isn't it? And is that four or eight of dex, what do you believe is the analgesic dose? Well, uh, we only have 6.6, 6, so <laughs> that's that's what we get. Yeah. But, you know, uh, that, that's what I'm doing. But, you know, we're starting to look at higher doses that that might be better. So, you know, we, we may we may in years to come realise that actually we should have been giving 20 or, or more. So so that's an, an, an area of really inter a great interest. And I do a lot of colorectal surgery as well. And, and you know, it's really teasing out. So it's all about doing the studies, for, for want of a better word, it, the studies that matter. So what what gives the best bang for the buck for our patients? That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much for your time this evening, Rosie. It's much appreciated. Thanks, Matt.